panellists have decided to team up and do a little bit of a double act and a PowerPoint presentation for us. Um, the first one, uh, the gentleman to the left there, is um, Salwin Pallet, and he is a entrepreneur. And he is currently the co-founder and director of a company called Amada Limited. He's been the co-founder and director of a swathe of companies across New Zealand, high-tech industry. Um, we're really pleased to have you here. Um, the second one is Mr. John Wally. And John Wally is the CEO of a, an employers group, the Manufacturers and Employers Association, and he represents Ma Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Thank you, John. And I tell you, any employers out there, he does a really good job on your behalf. He's negotiated the hell out of me today, and he's got longer than five minutes. So well done. Um, I'll hand over to you. Do I need this? Okay. Right. Selwyn and I are going to use PowerPoint slides because that's our experience. Um, we like to put data on the wall and then have an argument about what the data means. So, Mr. Pellet, next slide, please. No, oh, see, still early. Okay, a lot of the discussion, and, and, and I should say, you know, congratulations to the EPMU for pulling this together today. But for most of the lead up to this session, I've been overseas. So, so when I went away, uh, a lot of the discussion was there is no alternative, we can only do what we can do when we can't do very much about things like the exchange rate. And in my time away, the discussions actually moved to, it's not politically feasible to do it because the flat screen TVs and the petrol might end up being more expensive and we might have to make a choice between flat screen TVs and a flat line economy. And so, so the other element of the discussion has been, well, there isn't a crisis. So echoing some of the things that Peter said, I'll just put up a reaction to there isn't a crisis. This is a treasury graph, and I don't know if you can see, but the red line is the domestic economy growth in New Zealand since March 1990. And you can see that the domestic economy grew whatever, the blue line is the traded economy. And you can see that the traded economy, exports, have essentially ceased to grow since the middle of the last decade. That's a sea change. That change in growth rate is now starting to manifest itself in the things that we are seeing. Next slide, Mr. Pellet. I disaggregated export figures in terms of levels of processing. So primary, processed primary product, simply transformed products, say sawn logs, elaborately transformed stuff, the sort of stuff that Selwyn and I and most of our members actually build, the elaborately transformed products. Now if we look at the graph, the growth, the red line, I don't know if you can see colors, is basically primary, post-primary production. That's grown very strongly in that decade. The blue line is the elaborately transformed sector. And as you can see, it grew for the first five years, but since then it's been on a downward trend, as has the simply transformed product. So the parts of the economy that build employment that build skills are in long-term decline. There is a crisis. Handing over to Selwyn now. So I am an exporter and I've been doing it for many years. Started in 2001. This is 2007. I was at the Monetary Policy Framework Committee and I turned around and said, the settings we've got, both tax and monetary policy, are going to get us to where we are today. This is not a new problem. It's been going on for a long time. So whether it's the previous government or this one, the settings we've got were disastrous, and now you're starting to feel the effects. So what I want you to do is have a look at that graph. If that was a house, if you're investing in housing, would you invest in that particular market? 
We all understand housing. We're all bloody good at it. And we all think we're clever when the house price inflates and we've made a couple of hundred grand. Would you invest in that graph? It'd be pretty hard, eh? If that was your rental income from those houses, it's halved in 11 years. Would that encourage you to invest? Wouldn't do much for me. If that was the income you were going to your bank with to get a loan, what would you tell them your income was? So what is it? What business is that? Any idea? It's the exchange rate upside down. That's what I deal with. That's my business. If I export in US dollars since 2001, exactly the same volume back into NZD, so no change in my behavior, no change in my efficiency, no change in anything I've done, no change in the end price, in the market, in the US, my income since 2001 is halved. Now think about what that does to me. Do I want to invest more? Do I want to put more engineers on? You'd sit there and go, why don't I put it into property like everybody else? Why don't I back the other side of the economy, the inflating side of the economy, the bit of the economy that everybody else wants a high dollar for? Why don't I do that? And the moral answer is because it's wrong and it, we lose jobs. So if I invest in property, what job did I create? Not one. So background, I've generated over 300 jobs since I started and I've exported nearly half a billion dollars from the companies I started. A bit better than property. So what do we actually want? And John's and my message is almost exactly the same. It's the dollar stupid. Nothing else matters. You sit around a table of exporters, real exporters, who are exporting to the world, and you go through all of the other options you could give them. Nothing matters as much as the dollar. And when you've got labor rates that are as low as, and we sat around a table the other night, someone said, well, the labor rate in my product is only 16%. Well, you can do anything you like with the labor rate. It makes no difference to that exporter. The dollar does. So what we want is a balanced economy. And why do you want a balanced economy? You want a low dollar so you're exporting more so that you've got a surplus. What does a surplus mean? It means you're not mortgaging this country. It means you're not leaving your kids in debt. So there's a moral obligation to exporting as well. Or you can have the reverse, you're having a flat screen TV, you can mortgage the country, you can sell the assets, and you can leave us in deficit, your choice. So that's what we actually want, a balanced economy. The IMF says our dollar is 15% over value. I'm not going to steal everybody else's thunder because I'm sure, I'm sure David Parker's got a lot to say on that. But that's our problem, we've got an overvalued dollar. And there's a lot of talk about us being inefficient. Well, you're a bunch of whinging, moaning exporters. You're inefficient, and you know, if you could just get up to the right level, it'd all be okay. Well, it's crap. There's a lot of highly efficient manufacturers in New Zealand. And there is, they've got world-class practices. This happens to be Raycon. World-class, nothing wrong with them, operating at 80 cents today. And I guarantee if they were here, they'd be saying, and struggling at 80 cents. Now, for no fault of theirs, they go to a dollar. We let the exchange rate go to a dollar. What happens? Are they still here? Have we got an empty factory? Longer unemployment queues, and we've probably got a new factory in Vietnam or Malaysia or somewhere else. Let me tell you what, ef what efficiency really means when our government talks about being efficient. My story. I start off at 40 cents to the dollar, every job's in New Zealand. 60 cents to the dollar, manufacturing's gone. 80 cents to the dollar, I start thinking about hiring US employees instead of New Zealand employees because now my engineers are about the same price. Dollar for dollar, I'm gone. I'm no longer here. There is no logical reason for my businesses 
to be in New Zealand when it's dollar for dollar and my end market is the US. So that's what we're competing with.